Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Can You See Me, ANSI and FR? I'm Ed Rutkowski, Editor-in-Chief of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all our listeners for attending today's event, and especially Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring this webinar. I'm pleased to welcome back our presenter today, Derek Fang. Derek has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry in a variety of roles for over 20 years. In his current position as a technical training manager at Bulwark, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark universities. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing and help companies design and implement an FR clothing program and comply with OSHA standards for training requirements for PPE. Now, Derek, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ed, for that very nice introduction. and. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are listening to us today. And thank you very much for taking time out of your day to spend with us on this interesting topic. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, let's take care of the attorneys. Uh, customers of Bulwark Protective Apparel are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard assessments. And customers of Bulwark Protective Apparel are solely responsible for selecting the appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with the appropriate gloves and footwear, etc. Because what we're going to do today is not going to be able to translate directly into every single scenario, so we have to do this. So let's get started. All going well. We've got a new format here that I'm just getting used to and hopefully I'll be able to pull it off, but here we go. So high visibility safety uh, apparel, HVSA is the acronym. Others you will have today is flame resistant. We'll have that as FR. And arc rated, AR garments. Uh, real easy. A lot of people get confused. All arc rated garments are flame resistant. Not all flame resistant garments can be considered arc rated. There's additional testing uh, that is needed to be done to uh, qualify uh, garments to be arc rated, uh, and we can get into a little bit of those as, as we go forward, but that's really what the distinction is. So today in our time together, which is going to be very short for this subject, but what makes a garment high vis? Review kind of, uh, you know, give you an idea of what the hazard is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about what ANSI is, and especially today we'll review the changes that came to us really in 2015. And you might be asking yourself, this is 2018, Derek, why are we talking about a 2015 standard? And the changes that happened three years ago, well, believe it or not, it took us as a market space, and especially in the, in the FR market space, really a good couple of years to get our heads around what those changes meant, how they would apply to our niche in the market being, being FR, because the non-FR world kind of transitioned into a lot easier. It wasn't as easy for us and, and on the FR side to get those transitions happening and what we needed to have to accomplish the ANSI requirements, but good news is we are there. There's a lot of availability to be FR, flame resistant, AR, and ARC rated and be ANSI compliant. So that's a lot of things that we have to do in, in the garment fabric world in order to make that happen. So we'll talk a little bit about those. We'll talk about how the standard overall collectively changed and kind of some of the influences uh, that happened there. We'll focus on really kind of what the labeling requirements are, what they're intending to do, uh, what their intent is, and really what they're trying to get away from. We'll spend some time there. And we'll talk about the industries uh, that are affected by all of this. So on the very elementary stage, how does vis visibility work? How does high visibility work? What is it doing? So really, there's a combination of three components that go into making high visibility uh, safety apparel. First, and what everybody readily sees and identify with is the fluorescence. That's the background fabric. That's your high visibility oranges, your high vis reds, and your high vis greens are, are, are the most, uh, however you designate those colors. It's really the most effective way for someone to be seen 
during daylight and, and low light hours. And you're easily identified. That's the person you know that you can see come off work and they're walking through the grocery store. Bam, that shirt pops out or boom, those sneakers pop out. Real easy to deal with fluorescency. Our eyes pick that up during daylight hours real well. Retro reflectivity, that is just like it sounds. That's the reflective component. That's the uh, strategically placed tape uh, arrays that help us primarily a little bit in the low light environments, but really at night, that's where a light source highlights that thing, reflects back to us. We easily can, can identify that there's something there. The third component, and this, what, this comes into play as the hazards increase, as the risks increase, as the environment can be uh, a little bit more chaotic. There's some other things happening in the background, and then you're dealing with uh, not only low light, but nighttime conditions. That's strategically placing that retroreflective taping so that our eye can easily identify that as a human being. Uh, the biomotion component, the structure, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go through. So fluorescency, we see that in the fabric. We talked about those eye-popping uh, sneakers. Uh, we talked about uh, those colors that we can easily see here. The two shirts you see on the right, one of them uh, obviously has a lot of uh, that fluorescence uh, background color. The one uh, to the right or tucked in behind it, that's our new type O category, and we'll, we'll explain more what that is. But how that satisfies the answer requirement, believe it or not, is just the yellow background, the fluorescency in that tape for that classification is what uh, helps it uh, meet those requirements. So as we said, it's especially impactful on, on during daylight hours, primarily cloudy days, dawn to dusk somewhat. It's most effective uh, to increase uh, the wearer's visibility in, in lit environments. It helps contrast really against the background. It's not as effective as low light transitions into uh, nighttime hours. Uh, your background material becomes ineffective at, at nighttime. So during daylight hours is, is when we, that background has its most impact. And obviously for contrast, conspicuity of that background. And we'll talk about some of the nuances we want to consider when we're thinking about where we are placing our people, do we want to have an orange background, a, a red background, a yellow background, and some of the things that we can think about as we're applying uh, that information. So here's your glass bead technology. Uh, you can see here the retroreflective part occurs when uh, the surface area, it returns a portion of the light that's directed at it. Uh, we, we see this all the time, we're driving at night, our, our low beams or our high beams pick up something on the side of the road. It might be a cyclist, it might be somebody walking, but the only way we're going to get that feedback typically is there's something reflecting back to us due to that light source. So what does that mean? Well, that means that it works, that's great. The downside is it works only when contacted by the light source. So if we're in a, an area to where we're coming around a bend or where uh, there's something obscuring our light source as a driver uh, and that retroreflective tape, it's not going to be seen. So we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at where we're placing our personnel during nighttime hours where that retroreflectivity is going to be key. Whatever light source has to be able to be get, come in contact for it to be effective. As you can see here, there's many examples, and we see this obviously with the construction on our highways, uh, construction zones. You can see that this is not uncommon. You can see the retroreflective technology in the cones. You can see it in the stop sign itself, and then obviously the worker's hard hat. Uh, you can see that he's wearing rain gear here. You can see it's down at his ankles, forearms. He's got a typical hands, uh, harness on for his class three uh, application. Uh, class three vests on the right, you can easily see because now we have the armband identification. Uh, class two, obviously you wouldn't have that. So you can obviously identify in our day-to-day -day, uh, where we're at, how re retro reflective technology is being utilized. We see it quite often. And again, great at nighttime, 
not as effective during low light and uh, daylight hours. The third piece that we talked about is biomotion. We are an innately programmed back in our prehistoric brain is to identify humans from other sources, what other may be. So when we strategically place retroreflective uh, capabilities, we can pick that up real easily. So if you have somebody that's wearing high-vis safety apparel and it's class three and it not only has the amount of reflectivity uh, strategically located, it's also strategically placed so that if I'm moving or even if I'm standing still, once it's picked up, that is easily identified as a human being. You can see, and the one in the middle, that that's quite obviously going to be interpreted as a human form. Uh, so biomotion takes that level of protection during those uh, hazardous environments really to the next level. Uh, notice that it's strategically placement of tape just just overwhelming a garment with uh, retro reflectivity is not good either because then everything gets washed out. It's strategically placing it in key areas, ankles, knees, forearms, biceps, uh, and then obviously traditional harnesses and things like that are much more uh, where the term you've heard, less is better, uh, strategically placed uh, in this case is better than just massing on uh, a lot of retro reflectivity. So what are kind of the hazards in, in a nutshell here? And, and they're very, I mean, you can think of all the hazards where high-vis safety apparel is, is going to come into play. But just looking at it from a hierarchy of control situation, uh, obviously when we have uh, moving vehicles and we have human beings, we would ideally want to eliminate any kind of interaction. Avoid pedestrian traffic where you have power trucks, moving vehicles, parking lots, uh, warehouse situations, get rid of the, the fact that we have to be there. Now, how realistic is that? Not very, probably in most work environments. So we have to look at things like substitutions. If, if a moving vehicle has to go through a door and a pedestrian or a person has to go through the door, eliminate or substitute the doors that they go through. Have separate doors, have pedestrian byways and have powered vehicle byways. And as you go down the uh, controls, look at, well, if they have to be in close proximity and I can't guarantee that they won't be effective, let's look at some engineering controls. Can we have mirrors? Can we have motion sensors? Uh, administrative controls. Do we go through our training? Do we take our power truck vehicles uh, operators and train them? And also, do we train the folks that have to interact with them, where they're allowed to walk, when they're allowed to walk, uh, what how they're allowed to walk uh, in and amongst uh, power trucks, things like that. Then obviously our last line of defense, as in anything, is our PPE. Now we all know PPE is great, but what, when is it great? When does it work best when we're actually utilizing it? Uh, Earplugs are very, very effective at certain decibel levels if they're in our ears. Safety glasses work fantastically if they're on our eyes and not perched on the top of our heads. Hard hats, really good at uh, helping us when things are dropped from height, but they've got to be on our heads, not tucked underneath our arms. Same with our high-vis safety apparel. Having vests allocated to everybody and having them sitting on those stanchions uh, in our warehouses propped up uh, behind and not implemented doesn't help us. So the biggest thing when it comes to implementing high-vis safety apparel is, is making sure people wear it when they're supposed to be wearing it, as is with a lot of our personal protective equipment. So where does it come into play? And this is just a snapshot. It's just one uh, of the areas in which high-vis safety apparel does help. It's by no means all-inclusive, but it does give you an idea of how uh, important things like this are. For example, when we look at uh, lift operators and power trucks, there's roughly about 1.5 million lift operators uh, qualified in the U.S. 
we just saw again uh, power trucks hit the top 10 for OSHA citations, roughly 3,000 on average every single year. Well, if you do the math, it's just a little bit under nine every single day uh, of the year of citations that are written uh, for uh, power trucks and lift operators and your vehicles like that. Uh, how does that translate into interacting with us? Uh, pedestrians, uh, employees. There's about approximately 100 fatalities uh, connected to uh, lift trucks and power trucks, about 95,000 injuries in a year, and 20,000 of those are pretty serious. So what does that tell us? Uh, power trucks win. Uh, motorized vehicles win. They tend to uh, be heavier, more powerful, and better built than we are, and we don't do very well when we interact with them, so we would rather not interact with them. Uh, so as we look at things, what's the most common approaches uh, when we're coming to intersects, blind corners, uh, you hear it all the time, we see the mirrors that unfortunately many times we get desensitized to when we're in a facility, we see the mirrors every day. Uh, sometimes we don't, we're not even really sure why there's a mirror there until it's too late. So we do see these uh, implemented. We hear the honking all the time. Again, many times we can get desensitized to these types of uh, uh, warning systems. Uh, so just things to think about uh, as you go through preparing to interact in these types of environments between uh, vehicles. So how does this stuff work? Remember we said the fabric, the fluorescence, is really good during daylight hours. So here you can see at 100 feet, that's the foreground. At 200 feet is the, the garments that you see in the background. And it's real easy to see which ones stand out and which ones don't, even in the lowest light. That yellow from neck to ankle is obviously, bam, that's right there. And you can see the various degrees of uh, fluorescency and reflective tape that's applied all the way down to none. So at dusk, now we're talking low light, dawn, dusk, low light environments. This could be considered even things that limit visibility like fog and rain and those kind of environments. So you can see there is a light source out there that's uh, picking up the fluorescency. And you can see as the background material diminishes, it gets harder and harder to see all the way to the end where that non uh there's no fluorescency there. There's no reflectivity. That's very, very difficult to see and probably would be hard to see if you didn't know that it was there. The next one, definitely the non-wearing high-vis safety apparel mannequin is gone. It's disappeared from sight. Uh, there's still a light source out there, but the light source is still not even able to pick up the non-high-vis safety apparel uh, wear. You can see how the degrees and how much reflectivity, the bio motion, remember the one that was in all yellow, that background color is gone. There is no longer a background color to be seen. So here in a couple of slides, you can easily say when we go, yes, the fluorescency is important during daylight and low light conditions and everything is dependent on reflectivity when it comes to nighttime conditions. So as you start to evaluate uh, where your employees uh, are going to be working, these three slides can really help you decide how much reflectivity if they go into those nighttime hours versus low light and daytime is going to be beneficial uh, depending on the hazard. So again, just to uh, review, combination of three components. First is your fluorescence, your background fabric. That's most effective during daylight and uh, low light conditions, dawn to dusk. Obviously, as it transitions into nighttime hours, it becomes less and less effective. Your retroreflective tape, that's most effective during night times and low light uh, conditions. So as they hand off 
If you think about the handoff, the backgrounds during the work, and I'm slowly handing it off to the retro effectivity that's going to do the bulk of the work, that's your low light conditions uh, in between. And low light, obviously, it's not just dawn and dusk. Low light can be fog conditions. Low light can be uh, rain, environmental conditions, cloudy conditions even. Uh, so just other things to take into consideration. Then the last one's going to be our bio motion. That's obviously effective during uh, the nighttime hours. That's where we're strategically uh, locating that retroreflective tape to mimic or imitate uh, that human form. So now let's go into, we've talked a little bit about the hazard. Let's go into the ANSI, the standard that we're looking to be compliant to, and that's the ANSI 107 2015 standard. So first and foremost, what is ANSI? ANSI is our American National Standards uh, Institute. Uh, they're part, well, the relationship for ANSI really is, if you look, if you know who ICEA is, that's your International Safety Equipment Association. They're the ones that draft the standard. They're the ones that uh, ultimately partner with manufacturers, uh, end users, uh, some government organizations, uh, general interest uh, groups. They form a consensus and they draft what they think is going to be a, a standard. That, I'm not looking for the, ratified is kind of too strong a word, but it gives you an idea. The consensus standard, boom, now it's an ANSI standard. So under ICEA, they write the ANSI standards. Hopefully that, that makes sense. It's been around for a long time, 100 years now. It really oversees and creates uh, lots and lots of really good uh common sense stuff, really good guidelines, uh, really just the right way, good sound, best practices. I mean, if you look at on a broad brush stroke of what our standards are, it, it's subject matter experts who work in that industry who come together and decide this is what we all agree on is the best way to go about doing stuff. And, and that's really how ANSI comes along, AS team comes along, NFPA, all our standards are in conjunction and really are the, the best practices in and around whichever particular subject matter that they're talking about. So what changed between in 2015? So we're starting to talk about that. The biggest thing that happened was is we had an ANSI 107 standard, which was really for uh, the Federal Highway Administration. It required workers to be in Class 2, Class 3 high-vis safety apparel when working on roads open to public traffic. We also had ANSI 207. That was our public safety standard, which addressed all the uniquenesses, requirements really for our first responders. If you think about what a first responder is, they have a lot of equipment, typically in a utility belt application that they need access to. So they had to have some unique uh, specifications in order to be able to access all that equipment in and around their waistline that really our 107 folks didn't. So there were two separate standards for that. What they did in 2015 is said, hey, look, Let's combine the two together. Let's create just one standard. We'll have it be ANSI 107, and they created one high visibility safety apparel standard for uh, roadways and public safety. It did a number of things, and really from an economy of scale thing, it saved us from having to uh, review and update two different standards. We now review and update one standard to put everything on the same schedule because you'll notice that ANSI 107 2010, ANSI 207 2011, they were being uh, updated on, on different schedules. Now everything is uh, under one uh, house. The big four that came out of this we just talked about was the consolidation. Uh, the other one that they came out with was we created uh, really three groups, uh, Type O, Type R, and Type P. Type R and Type P we've already talked about. Type R is our traditional highways, roadways uh, group. Uh, type P is our public safety group, our first responders. Type O is the new one, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but that's really off-road. 
uh, areas to where there is limited interaction uh, with, with moving traffic, uh, the traffic speeds are, are relatively lower uh, than traditional roadway speeds. Uh, areas that come to mind immediately is think about uh, parking lots, uh, parking structures. Uh, think about the last time that you got your car valeted. Uh, you've got that that valet is usually sprinting to get a car, coming back to get your cars. They're going in and out of low light conditions, in and out of those uh, car parks. Uh, that's those folks there. On the industrial side, right away you can think of mining, mining roads, uh, oil and gas exploration, uh, areas that have uh, either temporary roads or they're permanent roads, but under like gravel, slow work, slow speed conditions, that's where Type O is going to come in there. They defined it really nice in, in the nomenclature. It's called off-road. Uh, the other one that they came up with was a minimization of background for sizing, and we'll talk more about that. And then we'll get into uh, labels, and we'll talk specifically about labeling and the designations between non-FR and, and FR labeling. So uh, in here, they've asked to take just a brief poll, and everybody would be so kind. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a pop-up box. It's going to have an A, B, C, D, and E, if you would click on those. And the poll question that we are asking today is simply this. Labels can, be, can often be misleading. What should you look for to know your product is ANSI 107 2015 compliant? And your options are A, must state that the garment meets ANSI 107 2015 standard in the label. It must specify whether it's a type O, type R, or type P in the label. It must contain a pictogram showing what a high-vis safety apparel type it is. And it must include whether or not it's FR, and if so, which standards were used to evaluate its flame resistance. And then E, all of the above. So if you take time to do that, there should be a submit button on the lower right. Uh, so you should be able to click on that, hit submit, and we should be able to continue on here. So thank you for doing that. So as we continue on with our subject matter here, creation of garment types. Uh, background and the trim levels uh, do not exist anymore. Uh, the type O, type R, and type P have replaced level one, level two, level three. Our class system is still in place that you're familiar with. The class two and three primarily for our roadways and our public safety, and then the new uh, type designation that we talked briefly about is type O. Uh, this new type provides daytime and nighttime visual conspicuity enhancement for workers in occupational environments which pose struck by hazards from moving vehicles, equipment and machinery, but which will not include exposure to traffic on public access highway rights of way or roadway temporary traffic controls or what's commonly known as TTC zones. So as we mentioned, mines, warehouses, oil and gas uh, roads tend to be temporary roads, uh, both in refineries and, and drilling sites. On large refineries, large industrial sites, large plant facilities, uh, having some form of uh, background on the tape and some reflectivity is going to be beneficial. Uh, one of the most common configurations that we see in the marketplace today, if you've ever seen the uh, coveralls, or some folks call them jumpsuits, uh, that have the harness and the X on the back, uh, if you've ever seen that configuration, that's a Canadian configuration, uh, the thought process is actually kind of cool when you think about it. So they are trained, and the garments that they wear, is if I see the harness coming at me, which is as you would think, you see the reflectivity and you also see the uh, yellow background, the harness, that means that that person, or I'm seeing the front of that person. And ideally that person is then able to also see me. 
if I see the X, I know I'm looking at that employee's back. I know that that employee cannot see me. So again, as we are interacting in the environment between powered vehicles and uh, our employees' personnel, uh, we have additional information based strictly on the configuration of that strategically placed uh, striping. So just something to think about, something to consider there. Uh, type R is the one that we're probably most common with, uh, class two and three. It obviously refers to workers who are now working on those in those TTCs. They're on highways. They're on highways where they're encountering vehicles whose purpose is of travel. Uh, they're on public access highways, rights of way, et cetera. So obviously from type R, from type O to type R, we're dealing with uh, in increased speeds. We're dealing with uh, public and federal highways uh, in, in those areas. Uh, what are we seeing in the marketplace? Well, that class two and that class three designation, we're seeing a lot of default to class three so that they don't have to make that hazard assessment between two and three. So just a little bit of food for thought there. And then type P, we've kind of discussed uh, previously, but that's our first responders. The biggest difference there is obviously from type R to type P is it provides additional options for emergency responders, incident responders, and law enforcement to have access uh, to specialized equipment. The next big one that we, we saw was allowance for smaller size garments. Uh, in the previous uh, editions of ANSI, uh, you could only, in order to meet the background square inches, the reflective tape amount of square inches, you could only make a vest so small. Uh, if it went to any of the smaller sizes, uh, you were then not compliant to the standard. So what they did is they took a very common sense approach to this uh, uh, hazard because you've now introduced by having a uh, vest that's too big for that employee, you've now in introduced a hazard that wasn't necessarily there above and beyond the ability for that employee to be seen. Uh, hang-up hazards, getting caught. Uh, we've all seen the side of the road where you see that the, the young flag uh, person uh, who, out of no fault of their own, is either slenderly built or uh, on the smaller size, and you see that big reflective vest kind of hanging off of one shoulder. It's halfway down their, their, th their thighs, and we all kind of just chuckle as we drive by. But at the end of the day, it is introducing an additional hazard. So by allowing for a reduction of 30% in type R class two and 25% in type R class three, we are able to then construct smaller uh, vests, smaller garments uh, for uh, those employees who are then, we're taking that uh, out of the equation to where it's now, they're much more functional. Their chances of getting hung up are no different now because of uh, introducing a vest in the environment, et cetera. So new labeling requirements. This was a biggie. Uh, this was a biggie because now we're going into my real level of expertise, and that's into the FR world. Uh, what we had prior to this was a lot of high-vis safety apparel that was claiming to have flame resistant properties and those claims were based on very very limited testing and in many cases uh, were being introduced into environments where the arc flash hazard and or the flash fire hazard was what was to be protected against and this high vis safety apparel had not been tested to either of those hazards it had uh, obtained its designation of flame resistancy on uh, one, if, if, if not one, maybe two uh, test methods that are just the, when we look at the arc flash and flash fire hazards, some of the testing that we do is to begin additional testing. For example, we'll talk about ASTM 6413. We'll talk about NFPA uh, 701. 
uh, we'll talk about uh, 2302, which thankfully they have suspended that standard because it was being so misused when it comes to high-vis safety apparel and high-vis safety apparel and rain gear when they were being combined that it was uh, very, very risky and it was very, very confusing uh, for our end user customers. So what ANSI said in a nutshell was basically, look, if you are going to claim your vest and or uh, high-vis safety apparel is flame resistant and it can be used in arc flashes and flash fires, it has to meet one of five standards. The ASTM standards F1506, that is where that is your electric arc uh, standard for all intensive purposes. Uh, ASTM F2733, that is your uh, flash fire for, for rain gear. ASTM F1891, that is your arc flash for rain gear. The other standards are NFPA 1977. That one's not as common because that's our wildland fire standard. And then uh, one that folks are probably familiar with is your NFPA 2112. That's your flash fire uh, standard. So there have these designations have to be in that label, and that is the only way that you can claim to be flame resistant and ANSI uh, 107 compliant in the same garment. If it is not one of those, it has to tell you that this is non-FR. It is not FR. And that is extremely important. Why? Because there is a lot of substandard FR vests and rain gear in the market today that would fail miserably in an arc flash and a flash fire. And if you think about it, if you have an arc flash or a flash fire hazard and you are putting your people in shirts, pants, and or coveralls, and then you are also have a, an ANSI requirement, if you have the need for high-vis safety apparel, think about it. You have spent tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on your FR clothing program over the years, and you can be putting it in extreme jeopardy by putting one of these non-compliant FR vests on top of one of your employees. Uh, the rule of thumb that I tell people real easy is uh, if you're not, if you can't go back and check the second this this webinar ends, uh, there's two places you can check. One, you can go to your tool room and you can check what the vests and what the labels say and see if it meets what you're learning today. Or you can go down to procurement and you can talk to procurement and you can ask uh, procurement really quick. Uh, how much did we pay for our uh, vests last year? How much did we pay for our rain gear last year? If you paid less than $25 uh, for your high-vis safety apparel vests that are claiming to be flame resistant, you've got the wrong vests. If you paid uh, $100, $50 for a jacket, and $50 for a pant for flame resistant uh, rainwear, you have the wrong rainwear. Uh, arc rated and flash fire rated uh, rainwear probably going to cost you closer to four hundred, five hundred dollars. Uh, arc rated, uh, flash fire rated vest probably cost you closer to seventy-five dollars. Just a little, uh, uh, little bit of a cheat sheet there if you want to find out where your stuff is. What are we seeing on the market today that you have to be very, very cautious of? Uh, these, this type of labeling is misleading and potentially dangerous for our end users. Uh, this label in and of itself is a sample of so many contradictions. Uh, I just don't understand uh, why someone would do this. Uh, notice just right off the bat, what is in large, bold uh, for, font and what is in small, fine print, hard to see. Uh, then you have to ask, what are they trying to tell you? Well, first and foremost, if you read this label, this garment is made from 100% polyester uh, treated to be, to be self-extinguishing as defined by ASTM 6413. That in and of itself is a huge red flag when it comes to uh, 
vests and rain gear that you need to protect against arc flashes and flash fire. First and foremost, ASTM 6413 is a great test. It is one of the very first tests that we utilize in a bank of tests in order to get garments that meet and exceed uh, the arc flash uh, and flash fire standards. It's just one of many. It is not one in and of itself. Why? Because ASTM 6413 is not a performance standard. It tells you nothing about how that garment will react in an arc flash or a flash fire. So that's number one. Number two is 100% polyester. Okay, in order to give any uh, flame retardancy to polyester, we must treat it. Okay, so it's going to be treated. Well, what does it tell you in this label about the treatment? That treatment is going to wear out. Self-extinguishing properties diminish with washing. With washing or rain showers or stormy weather or inclement weather, you are putting a vest that claims to be flame resistant where those properties will, can, and are telling you they will wear out. When do they wear out? That is huge. Uh, what else do we have on here? Well, this one here, it has to state that it's ANSI 10715, it is non-FR. So it tells you per section 10.5 that this is non-FR. Then under the icon, what does it say? It says that it's type R, class 2, FR. And there's a claim again to ASTM 6413. Self-extinguishing in and of itself does not make it flame resistant for arc flash and flash fire applications. So what is this? Self-extinguishing is not a term that is utilized in the arc flash and flash fire world. It's utilized in test methodology to where it has to demonstrate that it self-extinguishes so that we can say it warrants much more additional testing before we ever determine that that garment can be, that fabric can be used to make garments that ultimately will protect our end users in a arc flash or flash fire scenario. So be very, very cautious. We see labels like this and others that are extremely confusing at the very, very least, if not highly misleading on what they are trying to market it as. Because if this is non-FR, why did they go to such extreme lengths to try and claim some flame-resistant properties? Now, at the end of the day, they will try and tell you that uh, those type of garments are never meant for arc flash, they're never meant for flash fire, they're melt for some form of slag, they might be used in welding, they might be used in some high heat areas, but they're never expected to be used in arc flashes and flash fires. How are you supposed to know that based on that kind of labeling walking into a safety house? It's very, very difficult based on how that's done. So just be very, very cautious. So the purpose of them going to such lengths and ANSI was to make this change. Primarily, they wanted to eliminate any potential use of treated polyester vests in all applications where you could have an arc flash or a flash fire hazard. Uh, as I said before, self-extinguishing vests are only intended for incidental flammable hazards that may involve potential exposure to welding, grinding, sparks, open flame, those kind of things. Uh, the new, with the new labeling requirement in place, we're hoping that our safety managers and those who are procuring these types of garments will have uh, much stronger guidelines and much stronger guidance into what to actually uh, purchase at the end of the day. So the real simples, as we're going from 2010 to 2015, uh, the introduction of types, type O, type R, and P for our job classifications. Uh, the classes, uh, we talked about one, two, or three refers to the amount of background and trim. The level terms uh, have gone. So if you have a type O class one, that's a certain level of trim. Type R class two, certain level of retroreflective trim. And type P class three, increased levels of uh, background and, and trim. So that's how they connect and they coach you through that. 
So that's how it looks like type O, class one, type R will be class two or three, and type P will also be class two or three. You will not have type R, type P uh, having a class one uh, designation. Again, just a quick review of what those uh, occupations are. We've talked about most of them, uh, nothing surprisingly in there on the industries that are affected with the types. So what do they look like? Again, what usually catches people off guard with type O is the background color. The actual fluorescency uh, qualification in order to be type O class one, there is enough yellow in that tape uh, array. So you have yellow, silver, yellow. That yellow background is enough to make it uh, type O. That's as simple as that goes. Your type R's, uh, class two, class three, various uh, looks here. And the really neat thing is from an FR standpoint and also an industry standpoint, they're providing a, a vast array of uh, fluorescent backgrounds, retroreflective tapes. The taping is becoming much more comfortable. We're seeing segmented tape. We're seeing additional tape technology coming into the marketplace, really improving here because as a market, uh, the end users are really driving this uh, due to the, the increased uh, need or want of, of this type of these types of garments. Uh, and then our type P, uh, you, you've probably all seen those out uh, and about uh, with our first responders, et cetera. So what does this mean for shirts, pants, coveralls, and vests? So type O, we saw there's some reflectivity, type R and type P, uh, that's our minimums, uh, uh, excuse me, class two is our minimum on the roadway. And then class three, depending on your hazard assessment, is going to drive you to the, uh, the greater need there. And it's not just uh, things like uh, uh, darkness, et cetera. Uh, are, you, are we building on the corners? Are there lines of sight issues? Is it, is it foggy? Is it rainy? Is it cloudy? Is it snowy? Uh, so you can go from a class two to a class three and it doesn't necessarily factor in the hazard there, it does not necessarily mean daylight hours to evening hours. So lots of other things to take into consideration there. Uh, what can go wrong here? Uh, we discussed extensively uh, in your rain gear and your vests when you're making those qualifications. Uh, we mentioned 6413, we talked about that's probably the most common. The other ones you'll see there is 2302. 2302, I told you, has been withdrawn. It's really on, it's been suspended so it can be rewritten so it can have some more uh, information built into it so that we don't see it being uh, misused in this case. 2302 tells you in the standard not to be used uh, in high energy electric arcs and exposures to flash fires. It's heat resistant and flame resistant, uh, but it also has been misused to classify vests and rain gear as FR, and uh, it's been marketed into those environments where it should not be used. The other big one to be aware of is NFPA 701. If you're not sure what that NFPA standard is, it's not even a garment standard. It is a drapery linen standard. It's uh, fire retardant chemicals that are added to industrial drapes and linens to slow down the combustion. For example, those big drapes in Las Vegas, I'm on the 18th floor. There, NFPA 701, that fire retardant on there is to slow the combustion of that drape so I can get from my room to the parking lot and safety in time. So that's going to wrap up most of what I want to talk today. Again, just really in, in summary, uh, we haven't talked about extreme conditions. Extreme conditions might exist. We talked a little bit about fog, rain, uh, sight and stopping distance, curves, hills, vegetation, all these things have to be taken into account when we're looking at high-vis safety apparel. Uh, we talked uh, contrasting your background color just real quick. Uh, people always or do ask me, Derek, what's the difference between an orange background and a yellow background? Some things to think about. Uh, people have told me that, hey, we wanted yellow backgrounds on the highways because orange was for safety barriers and cones. That's one way to look at it. Uh, the other thing to be cautious of, if you are working not on the road but on the side of the road, uh, let's say there's a lot of bloomage, let's say there's a lot of uh, yellow, there's a lot of green, you may be then taking that 
fluorescent green that you're wearing, and you may actually be coming part of the background. That's where orange may actually help you stand out. So when you look at those background colors during daylight hours and things along those lines, so you have the contrast uh, that it's intended for there. And just as we get here, we're going to be taking some time here for some questions. We've got about 10 minutes or so. Uh, usually with questions, if we get more than we can answer to, uh, the good folks here always send me a copy of the questions. Uh, I will do my best to get those answered and, and back to you in, in a timely manner. So uh, with that today, I want to thank everybody again for taking time. Hopefully, uh, this was worth your while, and I certainly enjoyed it and look forward to your questions. So with that, back to you, Ed. Great. Thanks, Derek. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we've got uh, um, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Uh, our first question comes from Philip, and he asks, is there technology of, available for machines such as forklifts to quote unquote see the high vis materials? That is a good question. And my hesitation is as I'm processing the question, when you're looking at the uh, the reflective component, the reflective component only is activated by a light source. Uh, and I don't think that's what Philip's intent is to ask there because now we're, we're driving our, our power trucks in low light or dark conditions. And I can see some of our warehouses and things like that being low light. Uh, we'd obviously have to equip our power trucks with a light source in order for that retro reflective to come out. Uh, I don't think we're that far away from having some sensors, uh, RFID technology, having sensor technology, uh, to where audible blips could be identified by uh, our, our power trucks. But the problem with those technologies, as I've seen them being incorporated today at certain safety shows, uh, unless they are very, very small and narrow, you end up just pinging everybody. Uh, you'd have to dial that in to where it's either directly within a certain distance of that power vehicle. Otherwise, you'd be picking up everybody and anybody that's relatively close. So uh, to answer the first part of the question, in, in low light or dark conditions, obviously we need a light source for retro reflective. And then additional technology is being built into safety vests so that our power trucks and that can have more of a sensor array type approach to it. Uh, probably not that far in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gary has a question. He says, uh, I regularly commute by bicycle. What is the best configuration of reflective materials and reflectors for cyclists? Well, Gary, uh, first and foremost, thank you for, for cycling where you can and contributing to uh, your lowering your carbon footprint. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Biomotion, again, and all three of those are going to be beneficial. Uh, look to uh, not only your personal, uh, you know, your, your shirts and pants, uh, your headgear, uh, but lights, and also that your, your bicycle is arrayed with some kind of retro reflectivity. Uh, so I would look at uh, strategically located, especially on the uh, calves and uh, thighs, uh, at least an armband, and then also uh, some kind of harness identifier for you because you're going to get the bio uh, motion feedback uh, with the retro reflectivity and then also uh, have a high fluorescent uh, as much in where it makes sense, whether that includes your helmet, uh, whatever vest or jacket that you're wearing, and then also that the appropriate lights both in the rear uh, your helmet should be lighted, and also uh, also a forward-going light, and that's really uh, probably a, a lot of the best that you can do in, in those areas. And that's not necessarily uh, that's from my own personal experience being a cyclist and trying to make myself as uh, obvious to traffic as I possibly can. Um, that's not anything that I picked up in anything that I read. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. 
Okay. Um, Michelle is asking about a, a different standard. Um, she wonders if you could talk about ANSI ISEA 203-2018. Uh, the easy answer for me on that is uh, I, I'll answer that one offline. Uh, I'll look that up and see where that uh, dovetails into what uh, we do. I do not know what that one is off the top of my head. Uh, but I'll definitely look into it and see if there's anything in my FR world and our ANSI world here that uh, coincide, and I'll do my best to uh, to answer that offline. Okay. Um, Gary asks um, about the standards that you were discussing. Um, do these standards apply to the HiViz T-shirt? Depends on what you're using them for. Uh, if you are looking, for, I mean, whether it's a, okay, let us let me back up a little bit. Uh, whatever classification we give the garment, whether we call it a vest, uh, and by definition of the vest just means no sleeves, uh, whether we call it a shirt, jacket, whatever, uh, what is the hazard and what are you looking for that t-shirt? Because I, I can have a long sleeve class 2, I can have a long sleeve class 3, I can have a short sleeve class 3 uh, t-shirt. That just tells me that one, I have enough square inches in the fluorescent background and I have the appropriate square inches and the dimensions of the retroreflective tape. Uh, so for my class two and class three, it's going to be two-inch reflective tape uh, with the appropriate uh, designations on uh, the areas that are going to get it to that classification. So whether we call it a T-shirt, a long-sleeve T-shirt, a shirt, a button-down shirt, a vest, a jacket, a, a hoodie, a zip-up hoodie, a fleece, whatever we call the garment, uh, doesn't necessarily either good or bad tell us what it's going to be uh, as far as a type R class 2, type R class 3. That all depends on how much fluorescent background and how much uh, striping we have and does it meet the uh, conditions to be ANSI. We have, um, and I digress a little bit, we have a lot of stuff out there that's called enhanced viz that does not meet the ANSI standards. Uh, there's not enough tape, there's not enough background. We call it enhanced viz because we might have some half inch or inch silver taping in areas, and we'll see this typically on uh, coveralls, uh, you know, a navy coverall that's on a refinery that has a slim uh, taping on it, that's enhanced viz because, yes, it is more visible than just a plain coverall, but it does not meet ANSI. So what we designate the garment to be is not necessarily any insight into whether or not it's going to be ANSI compliant. It gets to be ANSI compliant by meeting the requirements of the standard, which are going to give you uh, how many square inches of uh, background there is, how many uh, square inches there are of tape. Uh, just real quick, uh, you have 775 square inches of background color in a class two with 201 square inches of reflective uh, 1.375 tape. Uh, so that's that that's your class two. To go to class three, it's 1,240 square inches of background and two inch wide tape design. So whether that's a shirt, pant, coverall, et cetera, if it meets those class two and class three designations, then it's going to be ANSI. If it doesn't, it's going to be enhanced viz, and if there's and if it's none of it, it's just going to be a shirt, pant, or coverall, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks, Eric. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, for today. If I was not able to get to your question, um, uh, Derek's uh, uh, contact information is in the chat box. And I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, respond to you if you can send your questions on to him. Um, this is our last Synergist webinar for 2018, so I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy and safe holiday season. Best wishes for the new year. 
Uh, and thank you to all of our participants, to Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring today's webinar, and uh, thanks to you as well, Derek, for an excellent presentation. IHA.webbin.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link, and please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.